Mythicists love the Serapis myth. They claim there are similarities between the myth of Serapis and Jesus Christ. Because the former is mythological, so too must be the latter. We will examine those claims and the Serapis myth. Wait for it. We are myth-busting today on Ancient Egypt and the Bible. For those not familiar with mythicists, it is a brand of atheism that believes the most important portions of the Bible were copied and stolen from the myths of the ancient world. So, they believe that the Bible is essentially a plagiarized work. Now, in today's video, I'm not going to go into the differences between plagiarism and intertextuality, since I've already done that in a previous video. But that critique still applies to the matter of Serapis and Jesus. Yet, there is a direct claim of copying that does seem to strike at the heart of the uniqueness of Jesus Christ since myth, the mythicist claims that Christianity and the image of Christ was copied from the Serapis myth. Now, these comparisons have disturbed the faith of many Christians. Some of this disruption comes from the fact that the claims have cosmetic similarities but there is a problem that we have done a rather poor job in teaching that similarity does not de imply direct descent. So what we're going to do is we are going to look at the claims of mythicists with regards to what they see as the points of comparison between Serapis and Jesus Christ. Now. They break these claims into roughly nine points. The number of points will vary be from mythicist to mythicist, but they do seem to have these overall agreement of claims. So the nine claims are, one, Serapis looks like Jesus. Both have a beard. So the image of Jesus was copied from the image of Serapis. Two, Serapis healed and performed miracles just like Jesus. 3. Serapis was an immortal god of the underworld, like Jesus. 4. Serapis was called the Good Shepherd, like Jesus. 5. Serapis was called Christus or Crestus, like Jesus. 6. Serapis was a sacrificial bull, as Jesus was a sacrificial lamb. 7. Serapis was sacrificed for the sins of Egypt. Jesus was sacrificed for the sins of Israel. 8. The Serapis cult used baptism, bells, lights, vestments, processions, and music. And then finally, number 9. The Emperor Hadrian wrote in AD 134-136 that the worshippers of Serapis called themselves Christians. Okay. Now, from these nine points, according to the mythicists, because the two figures of Jesus and Serapis are so close to each other, Jesus must be a direct copy of the Serapis myth, therefore, he did not exist as a real human being. Okay, now, before we get into the mythicist talking points regarding Serapis, I think it would be really, really interesting and enlightening to take a deep dive into the origins of Serapis. Of course, myself being an Egyptologist, 
and knowing that Serapis is a god that comes from Egypt, it sort of only makes sense to explore sort of the Egyptological aspects of this as well. Now, the name Serapis comes from a contraction of the longer Osiris Apis, which is a, the name of a composite god. In ancient Egypt, when two gods were combined into one god, this was known as being a composite deity. Basically, two gods that, had, that were so, so similar that they were combined. And Egyptians did this frequently. Now, Osiris was the god of the underworld. He was one of the original five gods of creation. He was killed, dismembered, scattered, collected, sewn together, reanimated, and copulated with but has never been resurrected in the Western sense of the word. Osiris is the Egyptian version of Weekend at Bernie's. Now, the Osiris cult begins at Abydos, in the pre-dynastic period as a simple mortuary god. And during the Old Kingdom, he didn't have much support among Egyptians outside of Obidus. Perhaps one of the unique traits that the Osiris cult had that gave it an advantage over other forms of Egyptian religious expression was that the cult could identify popular religious practices and graft them into its own practices. This ability allowed the cult to remain relevant through incredibly sweeping movements of history. In Dynasty 11, the Osiris cult absorbed the Sokar cult that ritualized the eternal cycle of life, death, and life from death again, with its particular style of barks that inspired the corn mummies. Now, a corn mummy is essentially a, well, it's kind of like a mummy without a body on the inside. So it's just the outside of a mummy. And it's filled with grain. And then a priest pours water on it. The mummy is taken, left in the dark. And behold, living plants grow out of the mummy. It's a miracle. Okay. Now. Nevertheless, adding the, this practice of the corn mummies that was inspired through the Sokar cult to the Osiris cult proved to be very popular. And it was so popular that during dynasties 11 and 12, this combined Osiris Sokar cult received royal patronage. The Mill Kingdom kings had almost an evangelical zeal, which caused the Osiris cult to spread all over Egypt. Now, another cult that was grafted into the Osiris cult is the cult of the Apis bull, from which we get Osiris Apis. The Apis bull also goes back to the early dynastic period, like the Osiris cult. And the Osiris cult was a kind of fertility ritual, where a god was believed to have impregnated a cow to produce a bull of special markings. That bull was pampered, given a harem of cows to pleasure him, and then if he lived so long, he was sacrificed at age 25, partially eaten, and mummified. Now, theologically, the Apis bull was regarded as the physical manifestation of Osiris. When it was alive, the Apis acted as Osiris's representative and guaranteed the health of the king. Upon its death, the Apis became 
Osiris Apis, uniting with Osiris in the underworld. And like the Sokar rituals, the Apis rituals represented the agricultural cycle of life, death, and life out of death. But none of this is resurrection as such. The syncretizing of Apis into the Osiris cult was pivotal to the genesis of the Serapis cult. Until the conquest of Alexander the Great, this cult was situated in Memphis, where it found favor among a local Greek-speaking population. So even before the Greeks took over Egypt, Greek speakers within Egypt already had an affinity towards Serapis. However, after the conquest by Alexander the Great, the Ptolemies, basically the kings that came after Alexander, gave Serapis a makeover that transformed the image of the cult. With the conquest of Alexander the Great and his death, it was left to Ptolemy I to unify Egypt with both Greek and Egyptian populations. Ptolemy I chose the cult of Serapis as the vehicle to create national cohesion. Now, in its purely Egyptian form, the Serapis cult was a bit of a tough sell for the Greeks. Osiris is portrayed as, well, how do I put this? A decaying corpse. Ugh. And even Osiris Apis is portrayed as a mummy strapped to the back of a bull. Both these images would create consumer resistance among the Greeks who had an inherent revulsion to death. So, Ptolemy I gave Serapis a facelift so that he looked Greek. He needed to do this because the Greeks were very particular about how their gods looked. A god had to look human and very much alive. Dead gods were just not going to cut it. Now, the now Hellenized Serapis cult continued to syncretize elements of both Greek and Egyptian myth. It adopted the healing attributes of Asclepius and the solar deity traits of Amun Re. In a sense, he became the god of the kitchen sink. The cult's approach was to become the apex god of all things to all people. In the process of this transformation, Serapis became the Greek term for Osiris, and the Apis aspects of the cult were diminished. Now, when Serapis was exported to the Greek and Roman world, it was very successful. Where it took hold, it even supplanted local worship of Zeus and Jupiter. However, within Egypt, the response to the Hellenized Serapis was an unenthusiastic meh. Okay, now we've laid out the religious history of Serapis. So now we need to circle back to the mythicist claims that Jesus is nothing but a ripoff of the Serapis myth. Now, already you should be seeing that prima facie, when we get into the details of the history of the Serapis, it looks nothing like Jesus Christ. But we will go through each of these talking points and just discuss them and really get into these claims. So, let's take them one by one. Okay. So, the first claim that Serapis looks just like Jesus. 
both have a beard. So the image of Jesus was copied from the image of Serapis. Uh, now, this one, frankly, is just plain silly. Okay? Half the adult population of the ancient Near East had beards. Frankly, it's a stupid comparison. You know, Jesus as a Palestinian Jew, you know, probably had a beard. He was an Israelite. Of course he had a beard. You know, all the Greeks, all the Greeks had beards. I have a beard, you know. <laughs> it, it, it's a silly point of, of comparison because all it means is you're a man that doesn't shave your face. That's all it means. And frankly, in the ancient world, the only two cultures that, that shaved were the Romans and the Egyptians. Everybody else wore a beard, except for women. Of course, that couldn't. We also have to, to acknowledge that most of the early images of Jesus come from the Greek world. They come from, say, iconographic drawings from Greek orthodoxy. You know, that's a Greek culture. And what they're doing is they're taking the images of the apostles and Jesus and they're Hellenizing them for their churches. So this is not a copy of Serapis. This is a, a cultural affectation. You know, even if it were true that, that, that the portrayals of Jesus were being like, say, Serapis. You know? And frankly, the Bible gives us no description of what Jesus looks like anyway. We know he has a beard, and that's about all we know. So that's a pretty thin basis for making any sort of comparison at all. So this, this, sort, of, this sort of idea that Serapis looks like Jesus is just silly. Okay, next one. Serapis healed and performed miracles like Jesus. Okay. Now, many gods of the ancient world claim to be able to heal and perform signs. You know, what kind of god has no power that he can't do signs and miracles and healing? You know, this is just part and parcel to claims of divinity. And every last cult in the ancient world has these sort of tales of, you know, where people pray and then they're healed. So, I mean, even at the, at the sort of the temples of Amun-Re and uh, at Luxor, where, you know, Amun-Re is not exactly known as a healing god, people would leave amulets of, of, of ears at the, at the base of the wall of, of the temple so that the god would hear their prayers. Okay? So, you know, even in, in, in cultures where, you know, you don't have, where, where the deities weren't exactly healing deities or medical deities, as it were, you know, it was always expected that the god would hear a prayer and perform a miracle or through supernaturally power to affect a positive result towards that prayer. So, you know, just saying that, well, Serapis healed, so therefore, you know, and Jesus healed, therefore they're the same. It's a silly comparison. It's a silly comparison, because every deity made that. Now, we do have one difference in the case of Jesus Christ, whereas we do have a copy of a letter that claims that people saw Jesus heal. And this is in the letter of Quadratus that was preserved in Eusebius. In this letter, Quadratus talks about, quote, those who were not only seen in the act of being healed or raised, but were also always present. Not merely when the Savior was living on earth, but also for a considerable time after his departure so that some of them survive even into our own times, end quote. So, 
in this letter, Quadratus is stating that he knows people or new people who witnessed Jesus and his healing, and not only that, those he did heal and raised. We don't find this with Serapis. There, there's, there's no sort of letters floating around saying, well, I was healed by Serapis. We don't find that. We find testimony that people were healed by Jesus Christ. Outside of the Gospels. Now, this is outside of the Gospels. So this is, this is sort of extra-biblical testimony. So that, that's very different than Serapis. Point three, Serapis was an immortal god of the underworld like Jesus. Okay. Although Serapis is the god of the underworld, Serapis is still one god among many. Serapis is part of a polytheistic system. Jesus was never portrayed as a god of the underworld but as the God of all, living, dead, everything, the whole kid and caboodle. It's a different claim of deity. And while, say, Serapis was portrayed as an apex deity, he's still a god of the underworld in its, in its essence, because he's still Osiris when you get down past all the sort of the syncretizing. He's still just Osiris. Moreover, Serapis had no mortal presence except as a bull. So he is immortal only by virtue of never having been alive. However, even as the manifestation of Osiris, his, quote, immortality is only as someone at, that rules and cannot die while abiding in the domain of the dead. Frankly, it's easy to stay alive in the domain of the dead. Everyone's dead there. You know, everyone is, is walking around dead in the domain of the dead. That's a really, really easy claim to make. It's a lot harder claim to make that you were dead and now you're walking around in the land of living. That's a lot tougher claim to make. So, it's a, Serapis here is a lot lower bar than, say, Jesus Christ. You know, when Serapis says that he's alive, it's only alive, only, only immortal in the sense of, well, he's, he's alive in, in the underworld. You know, Jesus has a, has a, has a higher bar here in that, in that he has to actually come back to life after being dead. So, Serapis is not immortal in the sense of not dying, but as being alive in the underworld. So we can see just by this alone, you know, the two myths are not anywhere the same. Okay. Claim number four. Serapis was called the good shepherd like Jesus. Now this one's going to be pretty quick. To my knowledge, there is no reference to Serapis being called the Good Shepherd in any ancient source. I have yet to locate a source that, that basically calls him the Good Shepherd. Point number five. Serapis was called Christus or Crestus like Jesus. Okay. Since Christ is a common word for anointed one, it's a very, very common word. Uh, ancient cults using this term should not surprise us since many ancient cults did actually use the term Christ. And, frankly, other messianic cults also use the term Christ. Like, Bar, Bar Judas used, uh, called him the Christ. Now, the idea of a messiah is much older than even the Serapsic cult. And it's referenced in, say, the books of Daniel and Isaiah. However, we should point out that the Serapis cult did not have an anointed one other than the bull. 
The anthropoid image of the Serapis deity never carried the epithet of an anointed one. And that is because Osiris Apis was little more than the spiritual gestalt living in the underworld. Essentially, to be anointed within the Serapis cult, one had to be incarnated as a bull, as a bovine. That's the incarnation. That's the anointing. And that had to be selected. You know, when the priests of the Serapis cult had to find a new Apis bull, they had to go from bull to bull, pasture to pasture, uh, plot to plot, etc., to find a bull that fit the image. And it was that bull that became anointed. Not the same thing as, say, the messianic hope of the ancient Israelite religion. Not even close. Okay. Point six. Serapis was a sacrificial bull as Jesus was a sacrificial lamb. Wow. Uh, okay, here we have a confusion of terms. Jesus was never incarnated as an actual sheep. And Serapis was never claimed incarnation as an actual human being. So we're already talking apples and oranges. In the Serapis cult, Osiris manifested, but was not fully incarnated in the birth of a real head of cattle. The idea in ancient Egyptian myth was a god could manifest an image of itself in another body, whether that body be a idol or, in this case, a bull. But it wasn't the god's entire essence. The god could have many manifestations across many idols or even, say, possibly many bulls. Now, in the case of Jesus, his incarnation is unique. It's a one-off. There are no other incarnations. It's the only point in history where God becomes flesh. And being the sacrificial lamb, is actually not to be taken literally. He's not literally becoming a, a sheep with wool and horns. You know, he doesn't have hooves. He, 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 he's, he's, not, he's not walking around four legs with a woolly coat. You know, it's a symbol. And it's a symbol of the Passover. In the case of the sacrificial lamb, it's not a reference to Serapis. It's a reference to Moses and the Passover. Yes, there is a borrowing here, but it isn't of Serapis. It's of the Torah. It's of the book of Exodus. And, and, and this in no way suggests that Jesus was ever incarnated as a baby sheep. It's, you know, the, the idea here is, is just so, so, it's just ridiculous. It's just ridiculous. And frankly, even the sacrificial part of this statement isn't the same. The Apis bull was sacrificed by priests to continue the cycle of life, death, and life from death. It's a it's 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 cyclical eternity. The same thing happening over and over again. Life, death, life, death, life, death, over and 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 over again for all eternity. That's what the Apis bull is maintaining. Is cyclical eternity. 
the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. He sacrificed himself to defeat sin and to defeat death, not to perpetuate the cycle. Completely different. Completely different. And people who say it's the same either don't understand Serapis, don't understand Egyptian mythology, or don't understand Jesus, or all of the above. Because there's no way the two are anywhere remotely comparable. Not even close. Okay, point number seven. Serapis was sacrificed for the sins of Egypt, Jesus for the sins of Israel. Wow, this is this is just an this is just an automatic no. Uh, Serapis was not sacrificed for the sins of Egypt because Egyptian pagan religion did not have a concept of sin. Just it it didn't have a concept of sin. It had a concept of of acts that disturbed the order, but that wasn't sin. I mean, it didn't have it wasn't a violation against God. So it's not a concept of sin. Because that's, that's, that's what sin is. It's missing the mark in the eyes of God. Disturbing the order, disturbing the peace, violating the, the balance of ma'at isn't sin. It, it's, 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 not even, it's not even related. It's a whole different you know, paradigm. It's a whole different way of viewing the world. So, I mean, Egypt didn't have a concept of sin. And the concept of sin would not come to Egypt until it is essentially introduced by Christianity. And it's at that point that sin becomes introduced to, to say, Egyptian thought. Now, Serapis, that is the Apis bull, was sacrificed to continue that cycle of life and death that we just discussed in point six. That sacrifice has nothing to do with sin and has everything to do with cyclic eternity. This point is essentially grafting Israelite religion upon Sraps' myth to attack that religion. You know, it's reading into Sraps' myth. is essentially eisegeting it. So, it's dead from the start. It has no basis in fact. Okay. Point eight. The Serapis myth used baptism, bells, lights, vestments, processions, and musics. Wow. <laughs> uh, I could certainly wax eloquent on this one. Um... Every cult in Egypt uh, had priests that were baptized. You know, you, you, you couldn't get into a temple in Egypt without ritually bathing. Every cult in Egypt had baptism. Every cult in Egypt had sistrums. They had ritual lights. They, they all, all wore special clothes. Uh, the ritual processions, oh my gosh, were magnificent in ancient Egypt. They're not unique to the Serapis cult. Not, not even close. And music. Oh, the music. They had lyres. They had, as I said, sistrums. They had cymbals. They probably even had drums. You know? <laughs> uh, uh, this, 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 this criteria is so vague as to be useless. It really is. Uh, because these were just everywhere in religious practice in the ancient Near East. So, if they were, if they, I mean, they were part of Israelite religion. You know, Israelite religion had, you know, baptism. It had bells. It had holy, holy fire and lights. It had vestments. I mean, look at the vestments of the high priest. You know, he had a turban. He had a sash. He had a, he had a, uh, a, a breastplate. He wore an ephod. Talk about vestments. I mean, those were fantastic vestments. It had processions. 
where the Ark of the Covenant was, was moved from place to place. That was done in a ritual procession. It had music. You know, the Psalms are, are all about religious music in, in the Israelite worship of Yahweh. None of this originates with Serapis. That's just silly. This is, this is stuff that, that's been in, in ancient Near Eastern religion thousands of years before Christ. And I think there's just no way, no way to sugarcoat that. That's just, that's just. <laughs> uh, that, that's worth, that's, that's, that's worthy of a belly laugh, honestly. Um... <laughs> okay, final point. The Emperor Hadrian wrote a letter that the worshippers of Serapis called themselves Christians. Oh boy, historians will have a field day with this one. Okay, now let's raise, uh, let's raise a question before we actually get into the brass tacks of this. Because the letter they're citing here at least if we take it at face value, claims to have been written around 134-136 AD. Okay? Now, there's a little historical problem here with the idea that the early Christians were so confused that they were really worshippers of Serapis and that the Christian cult got all its information, say, from Serapis, which is in AD 68. A mob of pagans gathered at the Serapis temple in Alexandria to essentially riot against Christians who were worshipping at uh, Bacallus. Okay? Now, the one thing that a riot does tell us is that there is an implied animosity. The idea that the worshippers of Serapis and the worshippers of Jesus Christ, if they hate each other, they also must know how they're different. So, that implied difference is sort of baked into the idea that you had a mob of pagans that were rioting. So, this leads us to then, well, then what do we make of this letter from Emperor Hadrian? Now, the letter comes from uh, a body of work called the Historia Augusta. Now, the thing about the Historia Augusta is it's sort of a collection of letters, documents, biographies, supposedly written by several Roman emperors one after the other. Essentially, six authors are attributed to having written the Historia Augusta. The problem is for almost two centuries, if not more, the Historia Augusta has been recognized as a forgery, and a forgery that dates to the 4th century AD. And the latest research on stylometry has confirmed that what has been discovered through anachronisms and historical and philological analyses proves that at least the first half of the Historia Augusta was the product of one author, not six. So this means that Hadrian could not have actually written that letter. And this is research that dates to 2016, so this is very current. Okay, this is really current. So what we're looking at here is a forgery, essentially. The purpose of this forgery was to provide a kind of satire. Now, at the time it was written, which was somewhat around, sometimes between 
the reigns of uh, Julian Apostate and Theodosius I, there was a revival of paganism in the Roman Senate. And one of the things we see from the Historica Augusta is that it is sort of doubling down on, say, the ethos of, of the Roman Senate and its, say, more pagan leanings. So, if you want to torque your enemies, if you want to really make an enemy upset, what you do is you say they're the exact same as their enemies. Okay? <laughs> So it's like it's like saying to the Hatfields and McCoys, "Hey, you Hatfields, you, I don't see any difference between you and the McCoys. You're exactly the same." And to get the other side mad, you say the same thing to the McCoys. You know, "Hey, you McCoys, you look exactly like the Hatfield. Hatfields. You dress the same. You drink the same moonshine. You're exactly the same." Okay. So that's here what's kind of going on in the Historica Augusta, is they're sort of poking a jab at Christianity by saying, oh, you Christians? Well, you know what? <laughs> Serapis call, uh, followers are Christians too. You know, see, they've been claiming it since Adrian. Now, whether this was known to be satire or a fake history in the 4th century is unknown. We don't know exactly the reception of the Historia Augusta. But that does seem to be the flavor here of what's going on. So, we can't take the Historia Augusta as, say, proof that uh, the followers of Serapis were ever called Christians. Even if they were, we still have evidence that there's an earlier, that there are earlier references to Christians being called Christians prior to this letter. We see this in the Acts of the Apostles. You know, the Acts of the Apostles are reliably dated to 90, no later than 90 AD. Okay. That long predates the purported date for this letter. We also find it in the Church Fathers, like Ignatius, like Justin Martyr, like Barnabas. A lot of the early Church Fathers which predate that letter, that forged letter, also mention Christ and Christians in reference to Jesus Christ. And in none of the early Church Fathers, and frankly we have at this point, hundreds of volumes of writings from the Church Fathers. You know, it, this is not a small corpus of writing. I mean, we have to be kind of clear about this. The Church Fathers wrote voluminously. They wrote a lot. And an amazing amount of it survived into the modern times. None of this is, 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 is say, forgeries by the Council of Nicaea or any conspiracy nutso theory like that. Okay, but we have reliable, say, testimony from the earliest periods of Christianity that show us that Christianity, you know, developed out of Israelite religion, out of Israel, was led by a leader named Jesus Christ. He was named Jesus, and he was given the affectation Christ. You know, Christ is not a last name. It's a title. His gospel was carried by 12 apostles, 11 original and one replacement. And they carried that message to the various apostolic sees and provinces of the Roman world. It did not come out of Egypt. Christianity did not originate in Alexandria, Egypt, at the Serapium, where they worshipped the cult of Serapis. It's a silly conjecture. 
and it, it defies everything we know about history. It defies everything we know about textual criticism, textual sources, uh, everything we know about, say, Egyptian religion. It even defies what we know about, say, religions of Levant. It just doesn't make any sense at all. And really, in the academic world, the idea that Jesus was a mythologized ripoff of Serapis is really a laughable proposition. Academics don't take this hypothesis seriously. And frankly, neither should you. Anyway, I hope you found this video interesting and I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you next time on Ancient Egypt and the Bible. <laughs>